So getting uh, the Reverend Falwell Jr. to vouch for his heart, uh, we want to take a look at where things go from here. With me right now, uh, the Reverend Tracy Blackman, who served on the Ferguson Commission in Missouri after the shooting of Michael Brown and the riots that followed. She's with the Church of Christ in nearby Florissant. Also, Pastor Stan Mitchell with Grace Point Church in Nashville, which calls itself a progressive Christian community. And then here in New York at 30 Rock with me, Jonathan Greenblatt, CEO and National Director of the Anti-Defamation League. It is great to have you all with me. And Reverend Blackman, I want to start with you. I think a lot of our viewers at home uh, will recognize your face because we saw on Saturday morning uh, just how close you were to the violence and the chaos in Charlottesville. You were on with my colleague, Joy Reid. I just want to remind everybody what happened happened to you. Take a look. I was invited in to give a speech uh, to that regard. And as we were closing down, uh, I've got to go, i got to go, i got to go. Oh my goodness. I don't know what is happening here. I don't know what just happened there. Uh, so, Reverend, I know you appeared uh, or were able to call back in to Joy and, and, and give more into that interview and also insight about what was happening on the ground. But you know and got to see firsthand uh, what the chaos, the violence led to that day. And then you later heard the president talk about both sides. What did you think of the president's response? And, and do you think that there is any way uh, that he could make it better? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. And um, I thought that the president's response to what was happening in Charlottesville was woefully inadequate. Uh, there are ways to make it better, but those ways don't just target the uh, uprisings that are happening. It does, doesn't just target what the white supremacists are doing. Um, but we can look at this administration and see by the appointments that he has made uh, that his choices are not very diverse. Uh, they're not very diverse racially. They're not very diverse ethnically. Uh, they're not even very diverse theologically in terms of having adequate representation across faiths. Uh, so if he really sincerely uh, is not racist and does not have uh, the intent of what is happening here, then one of the place, places he has the most influence is in the people that he puts in positions of power. Uh, the president also can alter his rhetoric some. Uh, the reality is that this is not an issue about what side is doing what, uh, though if you watch the, the tapes that have come out of Charleston, it is clear uh, that one side was armed and prepared for violence and the other side was not. Uh, what we're facing here is a moral dilemma in our country, and we need a leadership uh, at the helm of our guidance that will address the moral deficits in this country. It's not about whether he sides on the right or the left. It's about whether he stands for what is right for American people. Well, and when I say American people, I mean all of the people, well, it not does, select groups. It does get down to just the uh, basic functionality of what we learn as kids, right and wrong, and also Absolutely. what are American ideals, and where do we go uh, from this point forward where we know the history, uh, what we've survived and emerged from. But Pastor Mitchell, let me ask you, the first resignation from the President's Evangelical Council came on Friday. It was Pastor A.R. Bernard saying, it became obvious that there was a deepening conflict in values between myself and the administration. So if faith leaders are, are leaving uh, the President in terms of being able to provide Council, is that what faith leaders should be doing, or should they be kind of figuring out a way uh, to offer guidance and assistance to a president that obviously needs it? Well, Dr. Bernard actually said that's exactly what he was trying to do in the months that he was on the president's council. Uh, he was taken to task by many of us um, when he actually made the decision to be on that council. His uh, pushback was that he felt that he could be salt and light in that place. And so he tried to provide that salt and light, uh, some sense of preservation, some sense of influence with a man that on many issues he did disagree with. It finally became uh, insufferable and intolerable. And as he said, a line was crossed. Finding that line, uh, it's not an exact algorithm for sure. And we all want to have influence. Just how much influence we actually do have on this president and uh, his moral persuasions, I, I don't know. I don't know who has influence at this point, if any, in the religious community. Uh, Jonathan, we heard the Reverend Falwell uh, say that 
only groups that Mr. Trump called evil were the Nazis, the KKK, and, and white supremacists. Uh, but when you hear the Reverend Falwell there try to, I don't, you know, justify mm. the president's remarks in some way as just saying that it's politically incorrect, mm. uh, is that too broad of a stroke for an application here? I'm really not sure which set of remarks the Reverend was watching. The set of remarks that I watched and that I heard when the president said there were fine people on both sides. But there are no fine people among the ranks of Nazis. When he tried to divert the conversation to the quote unquote alt left. But look, there is no comparable side on the left to the alt right. Again, the white supremacists who amass with an idea of pushing a nationalist agenda that pushes out minorities based on how you pray, who you love, or where you're from. So and it's it's really not comparable. But the uh, the idea of when we learn more about what say those hate groups represent or wanting to have some type of ethno state uh, and specifically targeting uh, members of the the Jewish faith and we think about the fact that the president's daughter had converted to Judaism uh, his grandchildren mm -hmm. uh, are being raised uh, in the Jewish faith so don't you think this would be a slam dunk for someone in that position to be able to address what this really means, the basis of what it really means. It's quite baffling that, again, we have Jewish grandchildren running around the White House, and yet we have someone in the Oval Office who dallies with white supremacists. It's really hard for us to sort this out, but as the Reverend Blackman talked about earlier, we have this moral deficit, and yet the good news is that Jews and Muslims and Christians from all denominations are actually coming together. We saw it in Boston yesterday. We've seen it around the country this week. The bottom line is this, Thomas, we can't wait. We can't wait for a president who doesn't seem to get it, which is why I think you've seen business leaders, the clergy, nonprofits, even the army, and everyone in the GOP, except for the president, stand up and say, this is wrong. All right, I just wanted to play, and really, and hopefully we'll have time for it, just real quickly. Uh, I was flipping around the TV. I saw uh, the Reverend Joel Osteen on the today mm. and something that he said really struck me that I wanted to share with everybody in this context. Take a look. The enemy would love for you to become a slave to your past. Live guilty, discouraged, with the chip on your shoulder. Don't fall into that trap. The past doesn't have to hold you back. We've all had negative things happen, things we don't understand, but God has beauty for those ashes. He has mercy for mistakes. He has new beginnings. Nothing that's happened in your past, nothing that you've done has to keep you from the good things God has in store. Uh, that really struck me because uh, whether you're religious or not, uh, I thought the theme there uh, was, was important. Uh, and Reverend Blackman, would you agree with that? Uh, that? That in looking at what this administration has done so far, that there are certain things that maybe we can forgive but not forget uh, and and if so how do we do that and expect the type of moral authority that you're looking for in the occupant of the white house right now absolutely actually i do agree with that premise uh, the the place that i think is important to articulate is that you don't have to be held captive to the past but you cannot forget the past Remembering the past is what allows you to be free and to ensure that it does not happen again. Uh, I put those kinds of statements. I don't know where Joel Olstein stands on the president's remarks. I haven't listened to him lately. Um, but I also want to comment on what you said about Jerry Falwell. The, the reason that he is able to support this president, he said, is because he does not say what's politically correct. But both uh, Dr. Falwell and I are in the business of what is prophetic prophetically correct. Mm. And what this president said is in error to scripture. What this president said creates and helps to, to form a hierarchy that is antithetical to the gospel. We are not in the business of politics. We are in the business of the prophetic. We are in the business of a moral compass. And it is imperative that those religious leaders, for whatever reason they, they join that council, my question would not be who's getting off. My question would be why are the ones who are still there there? Uh, for whatever reason they got on that council, now is the time for those who have been called to, to 
to give this nation a moral center, a moral balance to stand up and to be prophetic. I wish I had more time because my Catholic guilt is really going to kick in by ending uh, our chat uh, with three such important uh, religious figures. But thank you very much for your insight, the uh, Reverend Tracy Blackman, uh, Pastor Stan Mitchell, Jonathan Greenblatt. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. Uh, coming up next, the biggest event of the summer. A lot of people are.